All right, I'm, pre I'm preaching on the topic of Islam tonight. Uh, I thought because a lot of you uh, don't really get a chance to go soul winning with me, so um, you don't really see like how I speak to Muslims and, and the things I bring up. So I thought I'd preach a sermon on it just uh, so that when you go soul winning, obviously in Lakemba and Punchbowl and whatnot, you're going to be talking to a lot of Muslims. And when we first started this church, we were soul winning in Punchbowl, and I didn't really know that much about Islam, so I've learned a lot over the last couple of years. And I find I, I, I can get further in the conversation. So when we first started soul winning in Punchbowl, I just felt like I was just hitting my head against the wall, just talking to them, really wasn't getting anywhere. But now I feel like I can at least get to the point where I can challenge them, I can get them onto the same page as what I'm talking and get them thinking. So I've, I've got some Muslims to the point where they're like, well, I, I don't really know the answer to that. So I feel like I'm making progress in, in talking to them and, and getting a bit further each time. So I thought I'd just share uh, in this sermon the, the things, or I guess the sort of the tactics that I try to use and, and the things that I share with them. And hopefully it'll help you be a little more effective as well when you go out and preach the gospel to, to Muslims and, um, and chat with them. So... One thing, one thing when I, because obviously when we go out, you know, we, we try and get uh, the point to, we, we try and get to the point where we ask that person whether we can have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And it's really no, it's really no different when we go and preach the gospel to Muslims. Like we're trying to get an, we're trying to get an opportunity to preach through the gospel with them and then talk about the differences and challenge them on different things or answer their questions and whatnot. So, the first thing I want to say is when I, when I speak to a Muslim person, bef before I go into the gospel presentation and, talk ab and, and go to Romans 3 and go through the Romans road and whatnot, I just want them to know first up that I understand that there is a difference between Islam and Christianity. Because I think w before when I just used to go straight into the gospel presentation and not sort of acknowledge that, hey, you know, there is a difference between what you believe and what I believe. There's a difference between, you know, what Islam teaches about Jesus and what Islam teaches about going to heaven and what I'm about to show you. Then I feel like they, when they're listening to me, they understand that they're listening to it from a Christian point of view, as opposed to they're trying to listen to what I have to say, thinking that I'm ignorant about who God really is. And then I never really get through the presentation because they're always stopping me halfway and saying, oh no, God can't have a son and all this sort of thing. Why would... So I feel like if I sort of acknowledge that difference up front, I feel like I get further because then they know they're hearing out the Christian side of the story as opposed to, you know, all these assumptions that they don't agree with. So that's the first thing that, that I do when I talk to a Muslim at the door is I just sort of let them know, you know, I know that there's differences because obviously you can see sometimes that they are a Muslim or you assume that they are a Muslim if they say something like, I already know everything about Jesus and stuff like that. You'd, you'd probably assume even if they, they weren't wearing a robe or the lady wasn't wearing a scarf over their head that they might be a Muslim. So if you find out, you know, that their background is Muslim, and you say, then I might say something like, you know, I know that Muslims believe something different, but has anyone ever explained to you what, a, what the Bible teaches about how to go to heaven or what, what we believe about Jesus or whatnot? So just to, to, to establish that difference. Now, the, the, another point I wanted to bring up, and, and these aren't in any sort of order. I'm just sort of sharing you some thoughts and hopefully some of it helps you. Um, but one thing I want to talk about is the Muslim salvation. Now, one thing I've learned about Islam is that they don't actually believe in a work salvation. Now, I know that sounds weird to begin with because you say, of course they believe in a work salvation because they believe that you have to keep the five pillars to get to heaven. But what I've realized is, is they're not, see, they, even if you talk to a Muslim, none of them keep the five pillars, so, but, but none of them think they're going to go to hell for all eternity. It's because in the end, they're still trusting the mercy of Allah to get to heaven eventually. And why is that? Even if they, even if they believe, all right, that they, that they have to keep the five pillars and they don't know whether or not they're going to heaven, they don't seem to be concerned that they're, that they're going to hell. Now, I, show, I got this verse here because obviously from our point of view, it's very clear for us that we do not um, believe salvation by works, right? It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, what I've learned a Muslim believes is because they don't believe hell is eternal, 
See, that's a big difference between them and us, right? They, they believe in a temporary hell for a believing Muslim. The only people that go to hell for all eternity is an, un, is an unbeliever, right? Somebody who's not a Muslim. So this is why when you say to a Muslim, like, you can't work your way to heaven, when we say that to them, there's a sense of urgency, right? Because it's like if you end up in hell, there is no way to get out of hell, right? You need to believe on Jesus Christ. You can't work your way to heaven. Whereas they're thinking, well, I'm going to try work my way to heaven because even if I don't get to heaven, the way they think of hell, they just think of it as, as a temporary chastisement. Kind of like how we think of how God will just chastise us in love. That's how they think of hell, right? As a, as a Muslim. So they're thinking of hell similar to like a Catholic thinks of purgatory, right? They're just going there. They didn't make it. Their works didn't, didn't, weren't good enough to get to heaven sort of the first shot. But then they're going to go to purgatory and sort of burn off their sins and then eventually go to heaven, right? Whereas that's, that's similar to what Muslims believe. And this is why when you talk to them and you say, hey, it's not by work, and then they keep talking to you about, hey, you know, no, you know, but you, know, you have to work off your sins. And th they don't see the urgency of having to believe on Jesus Christ, having to um, believe you know, in, in, order to, uh, in order to get to heaven, because they don't mind going to hell. Like if you say to them, well, you end, you're going to go to hell, the reason why it's a big issue for us is because if you go to hell, you're there for all eternity. But for a Muslim, they believe they can go to hell. They might spend a really long time there, but eventually they will get to heaven, right? Because Allah will eventually let them into heaven and they're trusting the mercy of Allah. So this is what's, this is what's interesting. This is why when you talk to a Muslim, they don't think they're going to get to heaven by keeping the five pillars. Like they think you have to keep the five pillars to get to heaven, but they acknowledge that nobody can keep the five pillars. And this is why even Muhammad didn't know that he was going to go to heaven because nobody can keep the five pillars perfectly. And ultimately, they are trusting the mercy of God. And even though they may say, well, I'm going to go to hell, they don't believe they're going to go to hell for all eternity like we do. Now, and this is like something, it's, it's really important when you talk to them, so you understand this difference because I never understood why there wasn't this urgency that they didn't mind going to hell. And they used to always say, well, you know, I need to pay for my own sins. I need to be punished for them. And they always give the example of, well, if a child does something wrong, wouldn't a father punish that child? Because that's how they think of hell. Whereas we understand from the Bible, that's not what hell is like. Hell is where the unbelievers go. It's where somebody's punished for all eternity. It's not a father punishing a son. It's a judge punishing a criminal. And that's why it's an eternal punishment. But to them, the only people that go to hell for all eternity is an unbeliever, which is like what we believe, right? In a sense that if, we, if we're an unbeliever, they're the people that go to hell for all eternity. It's just that we don't have this, this sort of halfway house. So what I realized is they believe something very similar to the Catholics, where they'll work their hardest to try and get to heaven, but they won't be so proud to think that they'll make it to heaven, but they're not so worried about not making the cutoff because they know Allah is going to be merciful. And, you know, even though they might have to go to hell and be chastised for their sins, they'll eventually go to heaven. So that's one thing to keep in mind, you know, when you, when you speak to a Muslim. And, um, and, and this is why, you know, um, I just got here, the, the Muslim's purgatory. See, to us, hell is eternal, right? And that's why sometimes I'll, when I'm explaining the gospel to a Muslim, I'll tell them when I say, you know, the wages of sin is death, and if you don't make it, you go to hell. I, I make that distinction. I say, now, a lot of Muslims believe that you, you can go to hell for a temporary period and then get out, right? But I say in the Bible, no, no, when you go to hell, it's an eternal punishment. There is no out, right? And I might take them to Revelation 20.10 after I've showed them Revelation 21.8, right? All liars shall have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But I might just touch on here too, because I know that they don't believe that when they go to hell as a Muslim, right? Now, they do believe in an eternal hell for the non-Muslim, right? But for the Muslim, no Muslim will go to hell for all eternity. It's sort of like a purgatory. So I show them here. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I show them, hey, you know, no, once somebody goes to hell in the Bible, they, they, there is no out, Right? And this is why we need a savior. So when you speak to Muslims, I don't know if you've spoken to a lot of Muslims, but a lot of them will say, why does God have to become a man? You know, why does he have to become a man and die for the, on the cross? 
you know, and, and they're thinking like a work salvation person, thinking, well, you know, you should pay for your own sins, right? But then we understand that you can't pay for your own sins because if you did, you'd go to hell for all eternity. But in their mind, they're thinking, well, you should be able to pay for your own sins because you're just going to hell for a temporary period. So why should somebody pay for your sins? So I found that if I explain to them that hell from the Bible is eternal and make that distinction that they don't believe as a Muslim that they're going to go to hell for an eternity, that's why we need a savior. And it helps them to understand this is why we need somebody to save us from our sins because we can't just go to hell and then get out eventually. If we go to hell, we're there for all eternity. So that I feel is another point of difference when I'm preaching the gospel and I'm going through just the first couple of steps because the first point, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, they agree with that. They understand that they're a sinner and that they're not perfect. But when you get to the second point, the wages of sin is death, and then you talk to them that the, the punishment is hell, I, I, I feel that when I talk to Muslims and I tell them, no, I make the distinction that hell, from a Christian point of view, from the Bible point of view, is an eternal hell, then it helps them to understand why then Christians believe that there is a requirement for a saviour, and they don't think that. So if you're wondering why Muslims will always say that, why does God need to die for your sins? Why do you need somebody to pay for your sins? That's the reason why. It's because they think they can go to hell and then get out and pay for their own sins. And then there's no need for a savior. So just understand that difference when you're talking to them. Because I feel like when you don't understand that difference, you just keep hitting a brick wall with them, trying to explain to them the need for the savior. And I feel like that's the little intricacy that gets them to understand why at least Christians believe that there is a need for a savior and Muslims don't. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Now, let's, let's talk about the Muslim's Bible. Uh, now, let's, uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this is a verse that we often go to to show that Scripture is inspired by God, like right? it's the Word of God. It's, in, it's, in, it's spoken by God. And we have all the Bible because if we didn't have all the Word of God, then it couldn't make the man of God perfect, right? Complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, if you didn't have all the Word of God, how can you do all the good works? You wouldn't know what they all were. So this is one argument from this scripture to say, no, we have the perfect word of God. It's preserved today because if we don't have it today, how can the man of God today be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? And then uh, I didn't get to Psalm 12, 6 when we were doing the little Bible quiz, but it says, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, referring to the words that God is preserving, right? O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. A lot of uh, Bible versions have changed this translation to not say thou shalt keep them, referring to the words, but it says thou shalt keep us, O Lord, saying that God will just preserve a people as opposed to preserving his words uh, forever. They're purified seven times. And a lot of people believe, you know, that the King James Bible has gone through seven editions and whatnot. Um, I don't know if I 100% agree with that, but it's an interesting thing nonetheless, but I do believe that the King James Bible is perfect. But see, when you are preaching to a, a Muslim, right, they don't believe the Bible is perfect, the Bible that you hold in your hand. And often they'll say, you know, the, the, the Bible has been corrupted. But what is really um, sort of uh, disingenuous, I feel, or misleading when, when, when Muslims will say things like that, because Muslims will say things like, you know, I believe in Jesus and the Bible. You know, when you go to the, to the door, you talk to a Muslim, they'll say things like, oh, you know, we Muslims, yeah, we accept Jesus, we accept the Bible. Or they say things like, oh, you know, you can't be a Muslim unless you accept Jesus and the Bible. I don't know if you've heard Muslims say things like that. Um, and it's, it's, I feel it's really misleading. They, they'll say things like, oh, we know everything about Jesus, right? Because they think that what they've learned about Jesus in the Quran, that's, that's everything that there is to know about Jesus, right? Because the Quran is the final word of God to them. Or, you know, they'll say things like this to you. They'll say, you know, we, we Muslims, we follow Jesus even more than the Christians do. They'll say things like that. But you need to understand why they're saying things like that and not get thrown out. Because if you take that, well, they believe the Bible, 
then you'll start showing them the Bible, right? And then, then you'll, then, but they don't believe anything you're showing them. And the reason is, is because when they refer to Jesus and the Bible, they're not referring to the book that's actually in your hand. What we call the Bible. We call the Bible the 66 books, the King James Bible, what we're trying to show them. But what's misleading about the Muslims saying they accept Jesus and the Bible is what they mean by that is they actually have a different Jesus, right? And they have a different Bible because what they believe is that the Gospels and the Torah, they were given to Moses, there was a Gospel given to Jesus, but then that's been corrupted and it's not what we have today. But there was an original Bible that was given to Jesus. Right? So when they say, I believe Jesus and the Bible, that's what they're referring to, but they have absolutely no evidence that that book even ever existed. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So they believe that this, our Bible has been corrupted. So when we show them things from the book, this is why they don't believe it, right? Because they, they, it, it would be like if somebody tried to prove something to you from the Book of Mormon. You'd just be like, well, that's not the Word of God. So why are you proving things to me from a book that's not the Word of God? So you need to understand, like, that's how a Muslim thinks, right? A Muslim is seeing you show them verses from this book, and then although we believe that this book is the Word of God, they believe the Quran is the Word of God, and you're showing them verses from a book. Yes, they're listening, yes, they're learning, but they don't believe that this book is the Word of God. And this is why when you just say, hey, this is what the Word of God says, they're just saying, no, that's not what the Word of God says, because that's not the Word of God. So you just need to understand this difference and you can address this point with them at least when you talk to them, right? So don't be thrown off when they say things like, you know, I believe in Jesus and the Bible and things like that because they're not actually referring to the same book that you believe is the Bible. And this is why I think it's a little misleading because when they say this to people, I tell them, you know, this is a little bit misleading because obviously if you, if you say to somebody in Australia at least that you believe the Bible, there's only one book that people know to be the Bible. They don't realize that what you're saying is you're actually referring to a book that nobody has any evidence of, that doesn't exist today, but it's a book that you believe was given to Jesus at the time, but has been lost, right? So this is one thing uh, you know, that, they, that they don't agree with, right? So they say the Bible's been corrupted, and we show them from the Bible that Jesus was crucified, but they don't believe Jesus was crucified. They have a totally different Jesus. So when they say they believe in Jesus, they believe in a man that's just a prophet, that's not the Son of God. They don't even believe that Jesus was crucified. I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you know this, but in, this is where they get it from, in Surah 4, 157. Now, if you don't know the way, if you don't know how the Quran works, basically the Quran is a single book, right, that has 114 chapters and then you've got verses within those chapters. So when you see something like Surah 4, 157, Surah is just in, in Arabic for chapter, right? And then you've got Ayahs, which is verses. So because they only have one book, which is spoken by Muhammad, right? You never tell them that it's written by Muhammad because then they'll correct you, right? They'll say, oh, Muhammad couldn't write and all that sort of stuff. So you say it was spoken by Muhammad, right? Because he didn't actually write it down. All that's, all that's saying is that it's chapter 4, verse 157. So if you're flicking through a Quran, that's how you'd find it. So you can imagine we've got 66 books. So we, we reference the book, then the chapter, then the verse. They just reference the chapter and the verse because they've only got one book. So this is chapter 4, verse 157. It says, And because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, you'll realize that it always refers to Jesus as the son of Mary, right? Because they don't believe Jesus is the son of God. Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not for certain, but Allah took him up unto himself. Allah was ever mighty wise. So this is why when you talk to a Muslim and they say they believe in Jesus, they believe in a total different story. That he's not God, he's not the son of God, he didn't die and rise again, he wasn't even crucified, right? They do believe he's coming back again, you know, that he'll, he'll come. So they do believe in the second coming of their supposed Jesus, but they don't believe that he was crucified and that he rose again. And what they actually believe, I don't know if you know this, but they believe that it was actually, that he was actually swapped out. So he was on the cross or something, and then, then Allah swapped him out for somebody else. So that everyone thought it was Jesus that was crucified, but it wasn't. It was actually somebody else. And this is what, where they get it from. They get it from the Quran where it says, it appeared so unto them, right? So it appeared 
that Jesus was crucified and rose again, but it was actually somebody else that was swapped out. And this is why they believe, and this is why it's a bit unreasonable, because then, then what that means is that Allah actually started Christianity. Because if you think about it, the reason why the apostles had such boldness, and we read from 1 Corinthians 15, right, where we say, hey, if, if, there, if Christ be not risen, then our faith is vain, it's because Jesus did rise again from there. It's because the apostles saw him die. They saw him buried. They saw him rise again. And that was the reason why they went out and even started Christianity in the sense they went out and preached that Jesus had rose again from the dead and they had such boldness that they were willing to put their lives on the line for that truth. But a Muslim expects us to believe that Christianity was just like started because Allah swapped somebody out and then Christianity just started but it was all a lie. It was all just a fabrication because it would just appear to them that he died and rose again. Now, if Allah was so for the truth, why would he deceive all the Christians? Why would he just deceive them to the point where you have this problem now where they're all telling everybody that Jesus was the Son of God? That was the proof that he was the Son of God. That was, that was what they were dying for, and yet that was all a, lot, that was all a deception from Allah um, to the Christians. Now, um, I, I just wanted to show you here because another, another thing, and I know I'm sort of just like sort of jumping all over the place, just giving you some facts, right? But one thing that the Muslims will always say to you is they'll try and say that the, the, that the Quran is the word of God because it's just been memorized by so many people. And, and that sounds like something that is really, uh, it's, it's like a task that you're just like, oh, wow, somebody's memorized the whole Quran. And, they, and they'll ask you, well, who's memorized the whole Bible, right? And you're like, well, I don't know who's memorized the whole Bible because the Bible is a really long book. But I don't know if you've ever realized the difference in length between the Quran and the Bible, but I've just looked up these stats here. But if you were to just count the number of verses that are in the Quran, there's 6,236. Now, that's still a pretty good feat. Like if somebody can memorize 6,236 verses, that's still a, a, a job well done. But to compare the number of people that have memorized that number of verses and say that nobody has memorized the entire Bible, it's just unfair. Because the New Testament, if you look at the New Testament, the New Testament has 7,957 verses. And if you have a full Bible, I mean, how big is the New Testament compared to the rest of Scripture, compared to the Old Testament? So you can see how small the Quran is actually to the Bible, to the 66 books of the Bible. It only actually compares to the 27 books of the New Testament. But remember, the 27 books of the New Testament are a fraction of the 66 books of the Bible, even though it sounds like it's about, you know, um, a third or whatnot, because we've got 39 books and 27 books. Um, you know, it's almost, what, 40, 60 split. But the Quran is a lot shorter uh, than the full length of the Bible. But even if somebody memorizes the whole Quran, it's still a, it's still a quite a feat. It's like memorizing the first four Gospels, I believe it is, if you were to memorize those. Huh. Okay. So they'll say things like, you know, I believe Jesus and the Bible. You can't be a Muslim, not believe in Jesus. I know everything about Jesus. And the reason why they say that is because they have another Jesus, right? They don't believe the Jesus that we believe in. It's like the Mormons. They say they believe in Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. Same with the Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe in a Jesus, but it's not the same Jesus we believe in because they don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe that he was crucified. Now, here are some things that I like to bring up with them because in, in the Quran, it says here in Surah 547, it says, uh, let the people of the gospel judge by that which Allah hath revealed therein. Whoso judgeth not by that which Allah hath revealed, such are evil livers. So they believe that Jesus was delivered the gospel, right? And that's the, that's the gospel that they believe in, the one that we don't know about today. We don't have it today. But there was one that was given to Jesus. It was lost and his disciples basically spread a different message and corrupted it. But what's interesting about that is in Surah 547, Basically, this is a surah where people were challenging, you know, the Christians of the day, because Christians existed when, when, the, when the Quran came into existence, when Muhammad came onto the scene, because Muhammad came in 600 AD, 600 years after Jesus had already gone. Now, 600 years later, people are challenging Muhammad, right? They're challenging the teachings of Islam and all these sorts of things. So 
Muhammad, right, he's delivered this surah, this, this verse here that says, hey, let the people of the gospel, which is uh, the Christians, judge by which Allah hath revealed therein. So he's telling the Christians, you should judge what I'm saying, what I'm preaching to you, by what's actually in the gospels. Now, what's interesting about that, because when you say that to a Muslim, right, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, it's the original gospel, right? It's the original gospel that was given to Jesus. That's what they should be judging by, not the corrupt book that you have today. Right? That's what they'll say. But what's interesting is that this surah was written or was, was spoken by Muhammad in 600 AD. Now, we already know what, we, what the Christians had at that time, right? Because if you look up the history of the Bible and what Christians were using in 600 AD, we have many different things that Christians were using. We have copies that date back to like the first century, to the second century, to the third century. We have different um, really early copies that show that the Bible we have today is the Bible that they were using back then. Not only that, there are thousands of different translations of the Bible as well that are scattered all over the place that, that, that are dated before 600 AD. Again, showing that the books that the Christians had at the time of Muhammad is the Bible that we have today. So you've got early copies. You've got translations that predate Islam of the New Testament, right? But you also have the writings of the early church fathers, right? The writings of really early Christians, you know, like today, people will blog, you know, people will write sermons, people will write articles about Christianity, and they'll quote those scriptures. Now, one thing that somebody did is that he looked at all like these early church writings, right? And he basically tried to compile the New Testament, and he was able to compile the whole New Testament except 11 verses just from the writings of early Christians. So it'd be like today if you tried to construct the New Testament, right? And you read a bunch of blogs from people and you've read a bunch of articles, you listened to a bunch of sermons and you heard all these quotes where people, you know, like even in my sermon, right? We've quoted Ephesians 2, we've quoted from, uh, from Timothy and whatnot. And you got all those passages, you could build the New Testament, right? Back together based on all those scriptures that people are quoting. So when you go to the writings of these early Christians, even before 600 AD, you have all these quotes of the New Testament and they're able to rebuild and know what the early Bible said and, and compare it to what we have today. So not only that, there's, there's no evidence of any other Bible other than what we have today. So what's interesting when a Muslim says, well, they believe in this other gospel, they believe in this gospel that was given to Jesus, you can show them at least this surah in, in the Quran and say, well, hey, we're, you're told even in the Quran by Muhammad to judge what Muhammad said based on the Gospels. And this was written in 600 AD, and we know what the Christians had in 600 AD. We know that we had the early church fathers' writings. We know that we had early copies. We know that we have translations. So where, where is this evidence? You know, Muslims always like to say they have all this evidence that proves that the Quran is true, that proves their position. But where's, all, where's this evidence of this Bible and of this, of this New Testament, of this gospel that was given to Jesus that the Christians supposedly corrupted? They don't have any evidence of it at all. It's just something they believe just based on what they're taught and what they think the Quran says. So when they say they believe the Bible, they believe Jesus, that's why I think it's very misleading because they don't actually have a Bible. And I've read answers online to this surah where people have challenged Muslims saying, hey, well, your own Quran is saying to judge the Quran based on the Gospels. And this is written in 600 AD. What book is Muhammad telling them to judge by? Right? Because they're, they're, because they're saying, well, it's not your Gospels that you should judge the, the Quran by because it's totally been corrupted. So people are saying, well, what book is it? Like, where is this book that we're meant to judge uh, we're meant to judge Muhammad by. And I read a bunch of these different answers from Muslim apologetic, uh, apologists. And their answer basically goes along the lines of, well, because it's been corrupted and because the Quran is a guardian over the truth and it's, you know, now you don't need the Gospels anymore because you have the Quran, you're basically judging the Quran by the Quran because the Quran is the source basically of the true Gospel because the true Gospel has been lost it's in the Quran, so to judge, by the, judge um, the Quran by the Gospels, you're actually just judging the Quran by the Quran, and that's how it shows that it's true. So it's a bit of circular reasoning, but that's sort of the best answer I could find 
online, but it's, it's amazing that they believe that. So, what else did I want to say here? Another thing that you can talk to them about, what I found as well, is because you'll show them a passage in the Bible, you know, that's, you know, that shows that Jesus is the Son of God, or, you know, you'll show them something, and then they'll say, oh, no, no, it's been corrupted, it's, you know, your Bible's been changed, and there's all, you know, which translation are you using? And they'll try and throw you off on that tangent. But one thing I'll say to them is, well, even if you were to give me any Bible, right, like, even if you were to give me any Bible translation that's out there, I'll still be able to show you the same thing, even from that Bible, you know, that Jesus is the Son of God. Because you've got people that are not King James only, but you can still show that Jesus is the Son of God from these other Bibles. You know, I, I've, I could turn to verses in an NIV, like John 20, right, where it says, that, you know, but these are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Yeah, they've changed a few. They've changed a few verses where... Um, I think it's in John 9, where the guy says, uh, you know, who, who is the Son of God that I may believe on him? And he says, I that speaketh unto thee am he. Like, uh, they've changed that in the NIV. But even in, uh, in John 10, when he says, you know, thou sayest, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. That's still the same in the NIV. You can still go to the NIV and show them in John 10, where he says, I said I'm God's Son. So there's a lot of other Bibles where, you know, where it pretty much says the same thing in a lot of the different verses. And if a Muslim says to you, well, well which one are you going to use? You just say, well, any of them, because any of them I could show you the same truth from any of these books. But see, what a Muslim wants you to believe, and this is what I've realized, is like a Muslim thinks that the Bible has been corrupted to the point where, you know, Jesus hasn't been crucified, he's not the Son of God, that the message that the apostles were giving were totally false, because this is the message of the apostles. The message of the apostles is that he died and that he rose again for our sins, is that he was the Son of God. So, but they expect us to believe that the New Testament was so corrupted that this is just an unrecognizable truth anymore, because in the Quran it's completely different. So even if you use any Bible. I mean, it would still preach that Jesus was crucified and it's the Son of God. So this idea that the Bible's been corrupted, it just doesn't hold water when you s sort of put it under certain scrutiny. Now, here are a couple of examples that I give that you can sort of note down if you go back over this sermon and just write down these surahs. But I want to show you a couple of these differences in the Bible and the Quran where the story is completely different. Now, the reason why I've chosen these specific examples is because what I found when I was talking to Muslims is they would say, you know, like I'd say to you, they'd say they believe the Bible and it's all the same, it teaches the same thing, and you try and show them the differences, right? You try and show them in the Bible. And the one I would always go to in the past is I would show them how Jesus was the Son of God, right? You say, like, hey, here's a clear difference because you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, but the Bible says that he is the Son of God. Now, the reason why I stopped showing them that example is because when I showed them the example that Jesus is the Son of God, it was easy for them to say, well, that's just a corruption, right? Because you want Jesus to be the Son of God. That's what the apostles have worked into the, book, into the Gospels, into the New Testament, to make everyone believe he's the Son of God, but he was just a prophet because they want to worship Jesus. But no, we worship Allah. So what I decided to do, I, I try and look for differences that were smaller, that were insignificant. It was just a difference, you know, why, why, would this, why would this have changed in the Bible? What incentive does, do the apostles have? Because if I could show them a difference that didn't really make it, didn't really mean anything, then that could shed some doubt on whether or not Muhammad is a true prophet, you know, whether he was a false, false prophet. So there's a couple I have that I try that get some thinking, and I'll just, I'll build up to the one I think is, is, is really obvious. But here's uh, Surah 231, it says, And he taught Adam all the names, then showed them to the angels, saying, Inform me of the names of these if ye are truthful. Right? So I don't know if you know this, but in the Quran, it actually teaches that um, God actually taught Adam all the names of the animals. And it was sort of like a show of like how man was elevated above the angels because he taught man something that he didn't teach the angels. You can read that in Surah 2. So... We know in the Bible it's the total opposite, right? Genesis 2, it says here, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground, excuse me, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would, to see what he would call them. 
And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Now, this is a story that has no significance at all on the deity of Jesus Christ, right? Like, it's just, it's just what happened in the beginning. We, we both believe that God created the world. We both believe in the story of Adam and Eve. But in the Quran, Muhammad teaches that it was, it was God that taught Adam all the names. But in the Bible, in Genesis, which is not even the New Testament, I mean, there's not really much, you know, they, they supposedly accept the Torah as well. But even, they, they would have to say that the Torah was corrupted to the point where the story in Genesis is now Adam naming all the animals. But see, what incentive does, 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 an, uh, does a Jew, right, living before the New Testament was even created, to corrupt that fact, right? So this is why I bring up these sort of examples, right? Because you're trying to say that the Bible's corrupted, but why would they corrupt this story? Do you know what I mean? There's no incentive at all to corrupt this story which just shows that Muhammad didn't know the story, right? Because Muhammad was teaching that God taught Adam all the names, but the Bible in Genesis, the very first book that Moses wrote, says that Adam was naming all the animals. So either Muhammad didn't know what he was talking about, or you have no case really to, to say why this verse was corrupted. So that's the sort of tact that I, that I take with them. I show them these differences and say, you're telling me that the Bible's corrupted, but why would this be corrupted? Right? I understand why they'd want to corrupt that Jesus became God and they're trying to elevate Jesus to God, create their own religion. But it's like, well, why this? You know? And if this isn't corrupted, this shows that, that Muhammad was a false prophet because if he was a prophet, he would know these things. He would know that Adam named all the animals. Here's another one. Where if you know, you do, and these ones I think are a bit more powerful because you know, these have witnesses, right? Because in the beginning of, of time, there are no witnesses. You know, Adam was there naming the animals. Who knew that he did that? We're kind of taking Moses' word for it. Whoever, you know, at the time, whoever wrote that. You know, we know that Moses wrote it, but they might not always believe that. Surah 19.7. This is the story of Zachariah. Zachariah is John the Baptist's father, right? Zachariah and Elizabeth is his mother. It was said unto him, so in Surah 19, one thing that's, that's always funny and one, another thing you have to realize about Islam is when they think about Christianity, they think, they think of Catholicism. That's one thing you have to realize. So they always think we're Catholics, that we worship Mary and everything like that. And this is why they'll say things like this to you. They'll say, you know what, in the Quran, we have a whole chapter dedicated to Mary. You know, Surah 19, you know, Miriam. You know, we, we honor Mary so much, we have a whole chapter dedicated to her, but there's no chapter dedicated to her in the Bible. Well, it's because we're not Catholics. It's because we don't worship Mary. And, you know, the Bible doesn't worship Mary. So they think they have, like, this thing on us. And it's like... So that's why in Surah 19, it, it's, it's called Miriam, right? It's a, it's a surah about Mary. And it's about, like, the birth of Jesus and about John the Baptist. But that's one thing you want to note as well. That's why they, they say, like, they honor Mary. That's why they wear, like, the covering. Because that's, that's, their, that's the way Mary dresses. It's not really told them to, 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 to wear that. Um, they just, that's why nuns and, and Muslims look the same because they're trying to look like this Virgin Mary. Pasura 19, it says, It was said unto him, O Zechariah, lo, we bring thee tidings of a son whose name is John. We have given the same name to none before him. He said, My Lord, how can I have a son when my wife is barren and I've reached infirm old age? So you see how the story is kind of similar, right? He said, so it will be. So this is when the angel visits Zechariah, right, in the temple. He said, so it will be. Thy Lord saith, it is easy for me, even as I created thee before, when thou wast not. So this is the Pictol uh, English translation of the Quran. I was trying to find out which one was the most, um, you know, uh, accurate. Because when you, when you look online and ask, hey, which, which are the translations that are just say it as it is, you know, because a, a lot of the new translations have kind of like sugar-coated things because some things in the Quran are a bit heavy-hitting, like, you know, when, the, when, when there's that surah that says you can beat your wives. Um, some of them have said, you, know, you can beat them, and they've, they've added lightly because it's not actually in the Quran, but they're trying to make it a bit uh, easier and saying, oh, it's actually a more accurate translation. But they say the Pictor one is the one that just tells it like it is, which is the one we want, right? Because we want to know exactly what the Arabic says. He said, my Lord, appoint for me some token. He said, thy token is that thou, with no bodily defect, so you've got nothing wrong with you, shall not speak unto mankind three nights. 
So I don't know if you know the story, but we're about to read it in Luke 1, 5. Um, does this line up with the story that we read in Luke? It says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. So they're very old. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John, so they have that right. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit of power of Elijah, Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, so this is where the story picks up in, in, in the Quran, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. I'm sent to speak unto thee to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, right? So he can't speak and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. So was it only three days that Zechariah couldn't talk, according to Luke? No, no, it was, it was many months, right? Because it wasn't until um, John was born that he was able to speak. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. When the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So the reason why I'm underlining them, they, them, is because this story is not done in a corner, right? These events that happened to Zacharias, when they're accounted of in Luke, there are many witnesses to know that this is what happened to this family. That Zechariah went into the temple, he couldn't speak, and when he came out, he was beckoning to everyone because he had lost his voice, right? He couldn't speak to them anymore. And people knew this story. People knew them. People knew Zacharias and Elizabeth, and even Luke, right, lived at that time and knew these people. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Now look at this. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son and her neighbours and her cousins. So you see here that this is a, not a story that's just done in secret, right? This is an accounting of an event that actually happened, that the community knew about, that family knew about, that, and they would have known that Elizabeth was barren and they would have known that Zachariah couldn't talk for the full nine months that she was carrying this child. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. So it wasn't until John is born... Then eight days later, when they go and circumcise the child, they go to name the child. They're going to name him Zacharias after his father. But they say, no, no, the mom says, no, no, his name's not going to be Zacharias. It's John, right? Because that's what the angel told us to call him. And then they bring over like, you know, like a chalkboard or something for Zacharias and say, what should he be called? So he writes John. And once he, says, once he does that, then he can talk, right? And his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed. And he spake and praised God and fear came on all them on all that dwelt round about them. Look at this. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So this is why Luke can account these things. Like Luke's a historian, right? He's a physician. He's accounting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's accounting the acts of the apostles. He knows all these things because a lot of these things were just known by the community, 
right? That Zechariah was one of the priests that went into the temple, lost his voice, couldn't speak for nine months, and then when John was born, he got his voice back again, and a lot of people feared and they wondered, hey, what's going to happen with this, this boy, right? Because it's a miraculous type of birth. But, you know, nobody, nobody's like worshipping John the Baptist, right? Nobody's do, you know, lifting up John the Baptist to what the Muslims think we're lifting the status of Jesus up to. So again, this is a story in the Bible that has no, like, it has no significance to the gospel of Jesus Christ in it. Like, it has no significance to who Jesus Christ is and why we would want to make him the son of God. But yet it's a story that is written by people that lived at the time. It's a story that was known by a lot of people. And the story is that Zacharias couldn't speak for at least nine months. So why in the Quran, something that is written 600 years later, why is Muhammad recounting it as though he only lost his voice for three days? Why? It's because Muhammad didn't know the story, right? He didn't, he didn't read. He didn't write. He's hearing the gospel from Christians. It's like, it's like people that you don't really know about Islam, but you just hear things and you're just recounting them. But the difference is Muhammad's recounting them as truth. And then he's getting all these things wrong right? This is why he's a false prophet. He's getting these things wrong that are insignificant. So when you talk to a Muslim, one thing I try and, and explain to them is, I'll generally talk like this and I'll say, you know, if you wanted to learn about Muhammad, you wouldn't go to something that was written 600 years after Muhammad, right? You, you, would, you would learn from a source that was written by people that knew Muhammad, right? Because if you wanted to learn about somebody, you'd learn from somebody that actually knew the person, right? And they say, of course, right? That's why they have the Quran. That's why they have the, the Hadiths, right? The Hadiths are the writings from Muhammad's disciples, right? Writing about the acts of Muhammad, right? Which is basically what the Gospels are. The Gospels are uh, Jesus' disciples writing about the acts of Jesus, what Jesus did. So you say, well, this is why we would go, you know, if you wanted to learn about Jesus, wouldn't you go to writings from people that wrote, that knew Jesus at the time, right? And this is why we go to the Gospel of John. This is why we go to Luke and we go to Matthew because these people actually lived at the time. They knew the people that were involved in the stories and this is why they're reliable, right? Like why, why would I learn something about John the Baptist from somebody that lived 600 years later? So you kind of get them to think that way and they think, well, yeah, well, why, why they wouldn't do that with Muhammad? You know, why would they do that with Jesus? And then again, you add to the fact that there is this story that has no bearing on who Jesus is and yet Muhammad gets the facts wrong. You know, he says that, so, you know, he gets the names, right? Zacharias and John, but then Zacharias was not dumb for three months and many people knew of this story. The last one I want to show you is just like the birth of Jesus Christ. So I talk, this is the one I use the most because I think it's, it's, it's something that's insignificant, has something to do with Jesus, but it's something that's very different in the Quran. Surah 19. It says here, um, we'll just read through here the story of Jesus' birth in the Quran so you can see what the difference is. In Surah 19.16 it says here, and make mention of Mary in the scripture when she had withdrawn from her people to a chamber looking east, right? So Mary is living on her own, right, in, in, in the Quran. She's withdrawn by herself to a chamber looking east and had chosen seclusion from them. So you see how he's saying, hey, she's away, she's by herself. Then we sent unto her our spirit and has assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. She said, lo, I seek refuge in the beneficent one from thee, if thou art Allah fearing, he said, I am only a messenger of thy Lord, that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. She said, how can I have a son when no mortal hath touched me, neither have I been unchaste? He said, so it will be. Thy Lord saith, it is easy for me and it will be that we may make of him a revelation for mankind and a mercy from us, and it is a thing ordained. And she conceived him and she withdrew with him to a far place. So you see how she is, has conceived Jesus, but she's like going away somewhere where nobody is. That's the story in the Quran. But let's look in Luke. It says here, Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall, this thing be, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee 
shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Do you see here, she learns, Mary learns about herself being pregnant when, or herself about to conceive when Elizabeth has already been six months pregnant. So Jesus is six months younger than John the Baptist, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And look here in verse 56. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So again, a difference in the story where Mary is not secluded somewhere when she learns that she is about to conceive the Lord Jesus Christ. She goes to stay with Elizabeth, right? So not only just did the community that knew Zacharias, that knew Elizabeth, knew that Zacharias couldn't talk, Mary would have known that as well, right? Mary would have known that when she went to stay with Elizabeth that Zachariah couldn't talk because he couldn't talk for the three months but that she was there up until the birth. So she stays there about three months. I'm guessing that she went to go stay with Elizabeth and then stayed there until John the Baptist was born. Look at how the Quran recounts the story though. Verse, 20, verse 23, Surah 19. And the pangs of childbirth drove her unto the trunk of the palm tree she said, Oh, would that I had died ere this and had become a thing of naught forgotten. Then one cried unto her from below her, saying, Grieve, grieve not, thy Lord hath placed a rivulet beneath thee, and shake the trunk of the palm tree towards thee. Thou wilt cause ripe dates to fall upon thee. So this is this lady travailing in birth, right? And, and, and Allah is telling her, Oh, you know, you need something to eat or something to drink. Just shake this palm tree and the, these dates are going to fall down. I, I don't know if a woman has the strength to be able to do that when she's like giving birth, right? So eat and drink and be consoled. And if thou meetest any mortal, say, Lo, I vow to fast unto the bene beneficent one, beneficent, and may not speak this day to any mortal. And then she brought him to her own folk, carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, thou hast come with an amazing thing. O oh sister of Aaron. And, and I've seen articles saying, well, some people say, oh, Muhammad got it mixed up that, you know, Miriam was the sister of Aaron and Mary was Aaron. But I think the apologists have come out saying, no, 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 this is a different Aaron, right? This is not the Aaron, obviously, that was, you know, in Moses' time. Thy father was not a wicked man, nor was thy mother a harlot. So this is like saying, hey, you know, you've come back, you've committed adultery, right? Then she pointed to him. They said, how can we talk to one who is, in the who is in the cradle, a young boy? So she's saying like, well, ask him, right? Jesus the prophet. And they're like, well, how are we going to talk to this baby? He spake. So now this is Jesus speaking out of the cradle. Lo, I am the slave of Allah. He hath given me the scripture and hath appointed me a prophet and hath made me blessed wheresoever I may be and hath enjoined unto me prayer and almsgiving so long as I am a, remain alive. Now this is a miracle, right? Like a baby that is just born, Right? He's not crying or anything. He's actually he's preaching the word of Allah out of the cradle. Right, Dutiful towards her who bore me and hath not made me arrogant, unblessed. Um, peace on me the day I was born and the day I die and the day I shall be raised alive. So I thought that was referring to his resurrection. I was like, hey, look, he was crucified. They don't believe he was crucified. They just believe after that switch out, he eventually died and then people are going to rise again because earlier on in the chapter, it says that John the Baptist says the same thing, that he's going to die and be raised alive. So I think they do believe in a resurrection or something like that, but that's not referring to the resurrection of Jesus. I thought it was. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. So see, again, they just refer to Jesus as son of Mary because he's not the son of God. This is a statement of the truth concerning which they doubt. It befitteth not the majesty of Allah that he should take unto himself a son. Glory be to him when he decreeth the thing. He saith unto it only be and it is. You'll notice a lot of Muslims will say things like that. Like God didn't need to like conceive Mary. He just says be and it is. This is where they get it from that he can make a virgin conceive just by speaking it. Which, you know, we would say, well, that's, you know, that's not the problem. But the reason why they have a problem with Jesus being the son of God is because when they think of a begotten son, they think of God actually having sex with a, hum with a human being. And that's why it's repulsive to them. So you need to understand that when you say, well, it's no, it's a begotten son because it was conceived of by the Holy Ghost. Just make that clear to them because when you say he's the son of God, that's what they're thinking. They're saying, well, you think God had sex with a, a human being and then he had a son? So to them, that's sort of repulsive. So keep that in mind. 
Well, let's look at the story here in Luke 2, right? Well, I won't go through it for the sake of time because you guys know the story, right? You know, the fact that he's in a manger, the shepherds come, they see him in the manger, and then they go. And, but I just wanted to show you in Luke 2 that this is not a secret story either, right? Where everyone knew that he was born in the manger, the shepherds came because of the angels, and then the shepherds went and told everybody that Jesus was born in a manger. So again, like the story of Zacharias, this is common knowledge. This is people, things that people knew at the time that the community knew. So I sort of make that case to the Muslim to say, well, wh why, like, I say to them, you know, you know how, G wh how what Christians believe about Jesus' birth, right? You drive past the church buildings in Christmas, you see the nativity scene. And I say to them, the nativity scene comes from the Bible. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. This is how we know how Jesus was born, right? But then 600 years later, Allah gives the word, right, to Muhammad. And Muhammad is saying that, Mary was secluded out in the desert and then she gives birth next to a palm tree, shaking this palm tree, right? I'm saying, like, why should we believe a, per a person when Muhammad never met Jesus, he never knew any of them there, and yet he gives a totally different account of the birth of Jesus Christ? So you just get them thinking, like, why is, is, is it because Muhammad didn't know? Because obviously if he's a prophet of God, he should know how Jesus was born, right? And but... But what adds, what's like the icing on the cake is, why is this something that the Christians would corrupt? Like, what does it matter where Jesus was born? It's, they have absolutely no incentive to corrupt the, the actual birth of Jesus Christ to being born in a stable with shepherds and in a manger. Why would they bring Jesus down to that level when they're meant to be exalting Jesus? And not only that, isn't the story in the Quran, isn't that more miraculous? Like if I wanted to exalt Jesus to God, to, to, God, to, to, to the to status of God, why wouldn't I want to keep this miraculous birth? If that's actually how Jesus was born and he spoke out of the cradle, like as a Christian, like that's good, that's good. That, that supports my case. Why would I want to get rid of that? So you see, it just, it just completely doesn't make sense. But I've shown this to a lot of Muslims and I've talked to them about it and you know, I, I know that I've got a Muslim to the point where they don't really know anymore because they'll say things like, well, I have to talk to my imam. I have to talk to my sheikh. It's like when you talk to a Catholic or an Orthodox, when you actually get the, somebody who, because they always start the conversation so, so avid, right? So they're just like, yeah, they know that the Bible's corrupted. They know this. And when you start talking to them about these things, then they start saying, well, I've got to talk to my imam about it. I've got to talk to my sheikh about it. Oh, you should actually go and talk to somebody at the temple because I don't really... But at the beginning, they don't start like that, right? At the beginning, they know everything about the Bible. They know it's being corrupted. You got all these different things. But then when you start talking, you realize they don't actually know as much as they claim to. They're just regurgitating things that they've been taught. So I show them things like this, and I've gotten at least Muslims to the point where they can think, yeah, they think, well, why, why would I accept what Muhammad taught when he didn't know these things? And, um, you know, there's no incentive to corrupt these things. I want to just go through this quickly as well, because I think this is really interesting. Because one, you know, one thing when you talk to Muslims, they always talk about the comforter, right? And they think that Muhammad is the comforter. And then when Jesus said he's going to send the comforter, that he was actually prophesying of Muhammad coming 600 years later. Now, there's really not that many passages in the New Testament that refer to the comforter. Now, we know the comforter is the Holy Ghost. But the interesting thing about them trying to prove from John 14, 15, and 16 that Muhammad is the comforter is that they can never do it consistently because they cannot, even though they want to say that Jesus prophesied of this comforter and go to John 14, 15, and 16, they can never believe that whole verse in its entirety. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you can take them to other places and say, oh, he's not, you know, whatever. But they're going to take you to a verse like John 14, John 15, John 16. But if we just look at the verse itself, they can't believe everything in that verse. So let's look at John 14, 16. It says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So again, they don't believe that Allah has a son, right? So Allah is a father to nobody, right? So, but, but Jesus is saying, I will pray the Father, right? So they'll go to this verse saying, hey, see, Jesus was going to, this comforter was going to come after Jesus. But Jesus is referring in that verse as well that God is his Father. Right? I'll pray the Father. And it says here that he may abide with you forever. Now, did Muhammad abide with us forever? No, he didn't because he's dead, right? 
even the spirit of truth. They'll say, oh, Muhammad's the spirit of truth, right? Whom the world cannot receive because it, it seeth him not, right? So, so we don't see the Holy Ghost, but we see Muhammad. So we don't see the comforter, but we see Muhammad. So Muhammad can't be the comforter. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, Jesus talking to his disciples, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, did the, did, the, did the early apostles, did they see Muhammad? Did they know Muhammad? Did Muhammad dwell with them? Did Muhammad dwell in them? So you see how they, they, they try and say that this comforter is Muhammad, but it's, it, they can't even use this verse to prove that the comforter is Muhammad. They can't go to John 14, 26, because that tells us who the comforter is, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father, again, will send in my name. Did Muhammad come in Jesus' name? Or did he come in Allah's name? He came in the name of Allah, right? He didn't come in, in Jesus' name. But Jesus is saying here that he's going to send him, the Father will send the Comforter in Jesus' name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, what I have, what I ever I have said unto you. So again, referring to the apostles at the time, but Muhammad didn't do anything for the apostles at the time because he, because he came 600 years later. Here are the other mentions of the Comforter. But when the Comforter is come, who I will send... Now, is that something that a Muslim would ever accept, that Muhammad was sent by Jesus? Right? Of course not, right? But in John 15, Jesus is sending the Comforter, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So I guess they could spin that one, because they could say that Muhammad did talk about Jesus. John 16, 7, this is the last one. Nevertheless, I say... I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So again, they'll say, oh, see, Jesus said a Comforter will come after him. Yes, but he also said that he was sending the Comforter, right? But Muhammad was not sent by Jesus. He was sent by Allah. So if they want to say that Jesus did send Muhammad, right, then that means Jesus is Allah, right? Because, because Allah sent Muhammad. Now, if you're wondering what surah they go to to say that Allah doesn't have a son, this is it's surah 112. It's just four verses. Say he is Allah, the one Allah, the eternal, besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was begotten, and there is none comparable unto him. So this is why they believe Allah has no son. Jesus is not the son of God because Allah does not beget, nor was he begotten. That's surah 112. These are just last three passages I want to show you from the Quran that sometimes I'll just keep in my arsenal just to see, you know, these are some really sort of questionable passages in the Quran. This is Surah 33, 37. They all come from Surah 33. So Surah 33, if you just remember 33, then these are the three passages in Surah 33 I think are weird. And when thou saidst unto him, on whom Allah hath conferred favour, and thou hast conferred favour, keep thy wife to thyself and fear Allah. I'll read on, I'll start from uh, here. So when Zaid had performed that necessary formality of divorce from her, we gave her unto thee in marriage, so that henceforth there may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adopted sons when the latter have performed the necessary formality of release from them from divorce. So basically the story behind this verse is Muhammad wanted to marry his, his adopted son's ex-wife. But because at the time it was kind of a questionable practice, um, you know, this is why this surah was delivered. So it's kind of like interesting that Muhammad wants to do something. There's confusion amongst the believers, right, in, in Islam. So, you know, lo and behold, Allah delivers a surah to Muhammad to say that it's okay, basically. That's why it's saying. That's why it says here. So that henceforth there, be, there may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adopted sons. So it's like, it's like the Quran is saying, we just want to make sure that there's no confusion, there's no, there's no doubt that Muhammad did the right thing here because you know, he, we're saying, Allah is saying, no, it's okay to marry your adopted son's ex-wife. So I just find that it's, it's very interesting that you know, it's, it's almost like this chapter just proves that, that, that to Muhammad, to, that, that in Islam, Allah was almost just like this puppet that, that, um, you know, that, uh, that Muhammad would use just to get his way. You know, if he wanted something, lo and behold, a surah would be delivered and then he, he could do that. And this is what is shown in Surah 3350. It says here, 
O prophet, lo, we have made lawful unto thee thy wives unto whom thou hast paid their dowries, and those whom thy right hand possesses, of, of those whom Allah has given thee as spoils of war, and the daughters of thine uncle. So it's going through a list of people that, that the prophet is able to marry. And the, the, what's interesting about Muhammad's wives is, is the Quran gives clear instruction that you can only have four wives. But then Muhammad had more than four wives. And not only that, it says, hey, you are able to marry these women, right? It gives a list of different people that he is able to marry. Uh, and a believing woman, if she give herself unto the Prophet, and the Prophet desire to ask her in mar marriage. Now this is what I find interesting about this surah. It says here, a privilege for thee only and not for the rest of the believers. Now if that's not something if this is not like the starting of a cult where somebody's just saying oh god's giving me a message and i can marry any girl i want but it's just for me it's not for anybody else i mean who's taking this person seriously like what like how can you get to say i'm preaching god's word this is something i got from god and you know what it's a verse about who i'm allowed to marry but it's a privilege just for me so i'm just letting you know that you know i've got this word from god i can marry whoever i want but only only me not you guys so that's another question. Well, this is the last one I'll show you. This is three verses later. This is Surah 3353. It says, O ye who believe, enter not the dwellings of the Prophet for a meal without waiting for the proper time, unless permission be granted you. But if ye are invited, enter, and when your meal is ended, then disperse. Linger not for conversation. Lo, that would cause annoyance to the Prophet, and he would be shy of asking you to go. But Allah is not shy of the truth. And when you ask of them, the wives of the prophet, anything, ask it of them from behind the curtain. For that is pure for your hearts and for their hearts, and it is not for you to cause annoyance to the messenger of Allah, nor that ye should ever marry his wives after him. Do you see what's going on here? It's like, basically, this is a surah saying, when you go to the prophet's house for dinner, don't come too early. Uh, just come just when you're bidden to eat and after you eat basically just leave afterwards because don't linger for conversation don't stay and chat because you're annoying him but he doesn't want to tell you that you're annoying him that's why a, that's why an ayah has to be given to him to tell you hey you're annoying him so don't stay too long because he's too shy to tell you but allah will tell you the truth can, can you see how silly that is that's like that's like me saying oh you know i've got a word from god that you know, don't stay at my house too long to talk afterwards because you're annoying me. But I don't want to tell you. I'm too shy to tell you. That's why God has to tell you, right? God has to tell you that, that you're annoying me. If this doesn't show, if these verses don't show that this is, a, this, is a, this is a book that's basically just written for a man to serve a man's interest. I even watched a video from David Wood where he quotes one of the sources where Aisha is writing because Aisha writes a lot of things as well. Aisha was his... Um, his six-year-old bride that he consummated when he was nine and whatnot. So she writes even things in, in, uh, in her writing saying, it seems like Allah is very quick to fulfill your desires, something like that, basically saying, you know, oh, like Allah is very quick to fulfill the things that you want, you know, by, by delivering you uh, these surahs, because it seems like when you want something, all of a sudden, you know, the, these surahs are delivered unto you. Anyway, so I hope, I hope that's interesting. I know it was a bit of a long one, but I hope that gives you a bit of ammunition when you go and talk to Muslims because we're going to be talking to a lot of Muslims when we go and knock the doors in Lakemba. So hopefully this just gives you a bit of information about Islam. I, help, I think it helps to understand how they think because when you're preaching the gospel, I mean, you'll do it similar, right? In the same way that you'll go through the plan of salvation, you'll, you'll talk to them about salvation by grace, not through works. But I think if you're aware of these things, then you'll know what they mean when they say it. You know, they'll say things to you, they'll bring up objections, and if you're just aware of these things, it, it'll mean that you, you'll know what they mean so that when you address their objection, um, you're actually addressing what they think, not what you think they're saying. Anyways, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, um, for your word. Thank you that we have um, a word that is tried and true. Uh, Lord, we have a word that, uh, you know, it's, it's not just uh, fables of men, that have no uh, corroborating evidence, no outside evidence, Lord, that, that can help us to show the unbelieving word, world that we have a book that is reliable. So we thank you, Lord, that, that we have the truth and pray, Lord, that we would continue to preach it. Give us wisdom, Lord, 
as we deal with all these different people groups, you know, we have like the Muslims, we have the Orthodox, we have the Catholics out there, we have the atheists, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we will continue to learn just what people believe and what they, what they, what they know so that, Lord, we can be more effective as we preach the gospel to them. So thank you, Lord, um, for teaching us um, and thank you for the, the consistency in your word. Um, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.